Hi, yes, Jackie here from the LGFA, and I'm on a Zoom call today with a very, very special guest. Uh, Dublin's Noelle Healy recently announced her retirement from inter county football. Uh, good news for opposition defences. Um, it was news, I have to say, Noel. Good afternoon and thanks for coming on. Took me a little bit by surprise, I have to say. I mean, you've had an incredible career. Um, the obvious question from my side, Noel, why is the time right for you now? Um, yeah, I think I, I said it uh, last week, I suppose. Um, and even just different interviews before, always the question always kind of comes up like about the balance between work and, and sport. And I kind of one thing that always said to me was like, it's, you know, I was happy enough as busy as I was. And I suppose as long as I was enjoying it and getting the, the like level of enjoyment um, and had the kind of drive and desire that I had um, to play with Dublin and to do it, then I was more than happy to still do it. And then I suppose kind of come in, I suppose towards the end of 2019 um, and 2020, it was just probably starting ever so slightly to kind of tip in the opposite way in terms of just not really getting that same enjoyment and kind of towards the start of the year, probably um, this year, I suppose, just not kind of feeling that same level of, of, of drive or desire. And um, I suppose I kind of felt myself that it wasn't something that I'd want to try either do a little bit half arts, I suppose, or drag myself through it and kind of do it for the sake of doing it or going along so I had a good long um, think about it and I suppose I was you know more than happy or delighted with what I'd managed to achieve um, of being a member of, of the Dublin team so far and rather than kind of I suppose totally burning myself out or um, you know overdoing and burning the, the candle at both ends um, I just decided now that the time was right and yeah just more than happy with it. Uh, and for, for good reason I mean we spoke um before we started recording, what I have to say, right, uh, one of my favourite players to watch over a long number of years, very underrated player, I would, I would think, in many respects, for Dublin in terms of the of your link play and and the amount of unselfish and uh, work that that happened right across the field. I thought your work rate was absolutely phenomenal. Your role of honour. Uh, this might take a while. Uh, TG Carroll All Ireland winner 2010, 2017, 18, 19, 20, NFL Division One 2018, NFL Division Two 2008, 2011. Leinster Senior Football Championship winner, too many to mention, 10, so we won't go through all the years. All-Star Award winner four times and All-Ireland winner uh, also at under 14, 16 and minor. And uh, TG Cahar Senior Players Player of the Year in 2017. Now, while that Senior Players Player of the Year is obviously voted upon by your peers, so to win that, uh, I know you were very much um, a team player, but that individual accolade, where does that rank uh, among all that you achieved? Um, yeah, I suppose it's very different from, from the rest of them and that it's kind of something that you, you achieve by yourself as you said it's it's nominated for and selected by your your players that you're playing against I mean your team can't even vote for a nomination so from that point of view um just yeah look it's such a nice honor to get even to be nominated that year I was nominated against Janeta Hearn who obviously is just a phenomenal player and then um Cora Staunton as well so um obviously that was you know that was kind of a, a dream in itself and then um to to win it in the end was just unbelievable yeah just such a nice such a nice kind of accolade to get um yeah and it was you know uh Dublin had never won uh won before as well so um yeah that was you know very nice yeah absolutely and I think back to um 2019 correct me if I'm wrong and your your stint down in Mourne Abbey so uh you go and you sweep the boards with Dublin and then not not content with that, you decide, okay, I'm going to win an All-Ireland Club medal as well. So you'd obviously linked up with Moore Abbey for the year and uh, an absolutely f fantastic club team. And they'd been knocking on the door for, for a long time, broke it down and then broke down the door again. Um, Noel, so to be part of an All-Ireland Club winning side, how nice was that as well? Yeah, that was brilliant. Um, I suppose like it's it's very different from my club at home in that like, Moore Abbey is a very small parish. Um, you know even going to visit the the schools afterwards like my my primary school that I went to had I think four or five classes of 35 kids there was nearly 100 children per year um in the school the school nearly had a thousand students and then uh the day after the other and final going into the two schools that the girls would have gone to um I don't know the teachers scratching their heads wondering had they taught me before who was this blow when they came in but uh <laughs> yeah it was just funny like even so just from that point of view the, the kind of the small size of the community um and to experience that and kind of really experience I suppose how the 
the GA club is really the focal point and you know the center point of the community and you know how I suppose the involvement of the community really thrives as a result of the activities in the GA club and then re reversed as well the kind of the, you know the the commitment and the involvement of the um, community within within the GA club to, to have that thriving as well all the you know the um, parents and, and things involved in, in the underage, the girls themselves as well. So from that point of view, you know, that was just something that was really nice to experience and I suppose a little bit different. And then, um, yeah, as you said, look, obviously we're used to being, you know, very much on the other side of of, uh, of teams to a lot of the girls that I played with as well. So, um, you know, their, their kind of, not not acceptance of me, but like welcoming of me um, was unbelievable. You know, they, they couldn't have been nicer, I suppose. Um, you know, just completely welcomed me with open arms and totally <laughs> made me one of their own. Um, and yeah, look, just like really thanks for them, first of all, for letting me have that experience with them. Um, and then absolutely just, you know, memories that I'll, I'll you know, I suppose cherish and kind of thankfully have um, forever. Yeah, I'm sure there was great celebrations uh, in the aftermath of that All-Ireland win, Noel. We won't go into those in depth, I'm sure. Uh, what goes on tour stays on tour, so <laughs> saying goes. But if I can take it back to... Uh, you know, dying seconds of the All Ireland final, um, and that move that led to Laura's winning point. Uh, you were heavily involved, so you get on the ball. You're looking to do something. You're looking to uh, create. You, you've been in in situations where you're chasing games, and you've also been in situations where you're running the clock down. So you're level at this stage. Um, so what's in your head when you get on the ball, Noel? Are you thinking, yeah, there's something on here, or when does that when does it become apparent to you during the course of that move? that, yeah, we could end up getting a point here and winning the game. I I passed a ball backwards to Emer Meany, and I think it, one of the Clonburn players could have easily inter like intercepted it. And to be honest, my heart was in my mouth that stage. So I was like, oh my God, Jesus, I've actually just lost this for them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I suppose, look, it's probably one of the things that the that brilliant core team um, epitomize just you know knowing how to you know never say die um and you know they kind of they played every single match to the last minute either controlling the game to the nth degree or just you know living and playing out every single last second um that a match could offer I suppose you know ladies football can change in two seconds goals can come um it's just such a fast-paced game I think we you know with Warren Abbey we'd always had very strong runners and great ball carriers through the back with the you know Catherine Coakley and Roisin Sullivan um Obviously, more of Callahan through the middle as well. Uh, Kiro Sullivan was on the bench at that stage, so obviously we lost, you know, a massive leader and obviously a fantastic ball carrier. But I think by the t there was a minute or something left on the clock. I think by the time uh, Roisin won the ball back in that half back line, in the full back line, and then I I don't really remember what was on my mind. I think a lot of people are probably wondering what was on my mind when I kicked that ball into Laura Fitz. But uh, yeah, I think you just have to. I suppose. In that situation, you're in the lucky situation where it's a draw. You're not trying to chase a win. So you kind of have that sense of calmness about it because anything you do really once you get it into your half of the um, pitch isn't going to lose a match, really. I mean, you're just creating an opportunity to either win it or, you know, at least see the game out. And, you know, we'd obviously would have backed ourselves to, you know, and had the confidence in ourselves to to perform and, and to grind it out, hopefully in extra time. So, um yeah, look, there was, you know, I mean, there was a minute to 30 seconds left on the clock and we just worked it down just to try work a score, either to, you know, win a free um, or, you know, thankfully we'd, we'd brilliant score takers between Darren and, and Laura as well. And thankfully, you know, the, the ball got to the right player to kick it over. Obviously, you'd had some great battles against the likes of, uh, of Kira and Darren uh, down through the years, Noah. So what was it like playing alongside them at club level and maybe getting that insight into, into what makes them tick and what makes them such winners as well? Yeah, I suppose training with them um, was brilliant. Um, you know, that they're, they're, you can see why Cork um, have been so successful and why they themselves and Murnabi have been successful. They're just phenomenally driven. Um, constantly talking, constantly giving feedback, just every single day drill they do you know they do nothing by half everything is you know to the full um tackling drills everything um and even just practice afterwards and you know in like their leadership as well off the pitch was something that I was really struck by as well and you can see why you know the two of them have been successful captains as well with Cork um you know it's kind of it's it's not the kind of shouting in dress rooms or things like that you know it's it's a it's a 
a quiet arm over somebody's shoulder or even just like in, in my terms you know just a, a text to say you know we're going somewhere do you want to come kind of just involvement like that you know knowing when it's someone's birthday bringing a cake it's all those kind of small little things um so from that point of view yeah it's, it's always nice to kind of get to know the people off the pitch and you know t- I think n- none of us really should or can be judged by who we are once we cross the white line so it's, it's always nice to kind of get to know that other side of people and that's what the all-star trips were great for as well um you know there's a full week of, of really getting to know people absolutely um so 2010 uh Noel, you come off the bench late on you sample that on ireland senior championship winning feeling you're probably thinking to yourself god this is great this is going to happen every year uh, but it didn't. It, it, you had to wait a little while for for the next one, and there was some anguish along the way uh, against your some of your aforementioned colleagues, and particularly fourteen, fifteen, and, and sixteen. Um, I, I just feel that looking from the outside in at, at Dublin, that what they had been through to keep going and to keep coming back, um, Noel was an inc- was was incredible. Uh, I'm particularly thinking of of the, the frittering away that ten point advantage against, against Cork in an All-Ireland final and, and losing finals of 15 and 16, but coming back and coming back and now being the standard bearers. So what was what was it like being part of the camp at that time, Noel, to try and turn some of those devastations into into the the platform for uh, you know consistent success that we see now? I'm not really sure. It probably was something that kind of happened... Um obviously over a kind of a gradual period of time I suppose as you said 2010 Dublin had probably been knocking on the door for a long time you know they'd been in the All-Ireland final 2009 lost by a point came back in 2010 you know just had a phenomenal season you know probably one of the best performances in an All-Ireland final was that 2010 final you know that team there was nobody that was going to you know beat us that day I think the girls there was just so many experienced players on that pitch and you know they really were just so prepared that year in terms of you know physical and mental um, and I think 2011, we probably had quite a strong team in terms of, you know, we kind of a lot of the younger players had probably graduated up. But unfortunately, we just lost an awful lot of our leaders, um, particularly from, from the back line. Um, you know, you players like uh, Maria Kavanagh, obviously Mary Nevin, uh, Bernie Finley, um, Avril Cluxton, just who, you know, just had the smarts, I suppose, and that little bit of intelligence, knowing when to, you know, when to run the ball, when to hold the ball, you know, even just holding on to a lead I suppose uh 2011 was a really disappointing year for us I think you know we didn't even make it to an answer final we got knocked out in the first round um against Mead and then came through the back door and unfortunately came up against a phenomenal team again in Cork um that stage we had a six point lead and you know not threw it away but I suppose uh Cork came back and beat us we probably weren't clever enough to hold on to it um and run down the game and then the same happened again I I took a year off in, in 2012 um, and then again in 2013 we were nine points up and threw away a lead and then in 2014 we were 10 points up and threw away a lead um, and yeah I suppose it probably was something that uh, did ha- like not haunt us a little bit but even you know the two years after that we, we went in up at half time and still you know had th- had a lead and kind of just didn't manage to hold on to it and I suppose maybe we just didn't have that self-belief and maybe we kind of thought that all we needed to do was to get ahead of the team rather than to beat the team and you know as soon as that was the goal for us and maybe mentally we kind of just weren't prepared or strong enough to be able to finish out a game we were probably focused too much on the end result I think you know obviously you know huge credit to Gregory McGonagall and the shape and the belief that he gave us and where he brought Dublin you know we never had as a as a unit that we were from 2013 hadn't got past an all Ireland quarter final and then all of a sudden we were competing in all Ireland finals and you know he was able to to instill self belief in us every year that you know we were good enough and I think you know it was something that we are massively proud of is that ability to kind of dust ourselves down and, and get back in the fight again particularly in 2016 you know we came back in the quarter final uh, against Tony Gall and, and managed to hold out the game and then the 2016 semi-final against Mayo was one of my favourite matches just to you know it was just a bruising battle and then the sheer drama of Sinead uh, kicking the point um, up in Breffney wasn't you know, it yeah what a game yeah, that was yeah up in Breffney last, last kick of the game I think you know that was something that was you know just brilliant again to be a part of uh, but you know I think we'd probably been brought as far as maybe Gregory um, and his team felt that they could bring us and um, I think the players themselves maybe felt that a little bit of freshness was needed 
I think there was a lot of people who were wondering, you know, were we ever going to win it? I know a lot of the girls themselves were just so broken and kind of hurt by giving everything for three years and really just not getting anywhere with it. Um, but, you know, Mick came in and he just stripped everything back. He forgot about winning all Ireland titles. Um, it wasn't even spoken about. He was, you know, maybe a little bit harshly to, to some of us, but, you know, which was just saying just as footballers, we, you know, that's where we need to be. We need to improve as footballers, forget the mental side of the game, forget, you know, any of that psychology stuff, if it was all just stripped back. It was, you know, sewing with your right foot, sewing with your left foot, hand pass with your right foot, hand pass with your left foot. And we did that for half an hour, three times a week for, for months um, and went through patterns of play for months. And, you know, it all just kind of clicked in. And I think we probably had a little bit of self-belief ingrained in us from, you know, managing to dust ourselves down. And then we finally kind of had the, the football smarts. And I could, I think it was Mick who said it in, in the documentary. I mean, that match in 2017 probably could have gone either way we were you know missing goal opportunities left right and center we were probably lucky that we managed to hold on to a little three-point cushion throughout the most of the second half and then I think Sarah McCaffrey came off the bench and Fiona Hudson came off the bench and they kind of gave us a you know they just gave us that energy and obviously Sarah's goal I think probably kicks out a bit of belief in us and it's true what Mick said you can almost see just you know the shackles or a monkey just coming off our back and all of a sudden just this belief and the sheer drive to just hammer this home um and that was just yeah I think I regardless of it being the first time I think the manner in which our team went about and winning that match is something that we're hugely proud of yeah I remember that day well the glorious sunny day as well and it was just it was written in the stars for you I think on on that occasion you talk about Mick and and, and his impact on the team well, I get the sense that you know you've got, you've outlined it very well there that you know get the fundamentals right, improve the skills, and the rest will will, will naturally follow. Um, he's obviously a very very uh, successful skills skills based coach with other teams as well, and you you reference Blue Sisters there as well. Can you tell me um, when uh, or who it was that broke the news that yeah you're going to be recorded here for for an entire. A season or period of time and it's going to be on the tv uh what do you think about that what, what was the process there i'm sure it wouldn't have happened without uh a majority or, or the vast majority of people involved in the key stakeholders saying yeah we're okay with this um yeah absolutely i think mick came to to us and broached the idea it was um or who who um who you know kind of had, had the concept of it um, it was obviously a risky one. I mean, we were by no means guaranteed to have any shape, form of successful season. We had a new manager coming in um, and like it was a bit of a risk from their point of view. There was we had a, a leadership team. Um, Shayla Hearn was obviously the captain. I was vice captain that year. And um, I think Sinead Goldrick, Fiona Hudson, Dee Murphy and Siobhan Woods were kind of part of a, a leadership panel um, and a players representation group at that stage. Uh, Mick broached the idea to us and we kind of said how we feel. And then we went to the general group and, you know, if one person didn't feel comfortable, then that was it. It was going to be, you know, plug pulled, but everybody was happy enough to, to go along with it. We'd have cameras and things like that before, just like different things, either AIG coming in, um, LGFA, TG Carter before all our finals. So I think from that point of view, it wasn't really that unusual. Um, they came in fairly early in our kind of interlude between the league and the and the championship. And it was usually just, um, you know, one man and his camera. So, we, you know, we were kind of used to a lot of new faces coming in that year with just different management. So he just saw, saw it in um, seamlessly. I think he had obviously done the Galway documentary before. So a huge respect for the dressing room and not kind of overstepping his boundaries too much. And, you know, really, he just kind of became one of the management team um, that year. and. Yeah, um, I suppose we kind of, in fairness, probably uses a little bit of a motivation because there was a story there, especially as the year went on. You know, it was like, oh, are they going to flop again? Fourth time, look, fourth time, the charm or whatever, fourth time and lucky. But um, I suppose we kind of felt, look, we're going to be sitting down sometime in the depths of winter watching this. And do you want to be watching a happy story or do, do you want to be watching history repeat itself again? So um, thankfully it was a happy ending. And I suppose, look, I mean, we are lucky we've got some phenomenal um characters and you know stories in our in our team um obviously Nicole and Sinead and I think yeah. some of the stuff that they focus on um was brilliant because it wasn't just a kind of cliched story about you know football or stats or things like that they kind of just managed to intertwine those stories really nicely um so I think it kind of you know it, it it was nice in that point of view and that it gave a nice insight and probably made people stand up and probably hopefully give a little bit of respect to ladies football but also 
um, I suppose, kind of show the, the different struggles that people have and um, to kind of, you know, this, the, the way you can come out from them and, and be on the other side and, and, and seek help, I suppose, be it with grief or, or with mental health. Yeah, absolutely. There was some powerful messages from it. Um, Noel, and I, I guess uh, sports fans sometimes forget that uh, players and athletes are, are human beings first and foremost, and there's always uh, the human behind uh, the, the athlete. And, and obviously, look, your, your identity as an athlete is very, very important to you as well. But you also have life off the pitch, um, Noel, and you let me get this word right. I've said it so many times. Anesthetist. How have I done? Excellent. Full marks, yeah. <laughs> at St. Vincent's in Dublin. And obviously you've been working uh, throughout the, the pandemic. Um, Noel, are we coming out the other side of this and how has the experience been for you overall? I'm sure uh, an experience you never expected you would go through in your line of work, but here we are. You're you, you fronted up as of all of our frontline workers and we're incredibly proud of each and every one of you. But how has the, the entire experience been for you, um, Noel? um yeah look it's hugely challenging um I suppose back in March it was kind of new and you'd see videos and from Italy and hearing stories from from China and you know everybody was kind of showed us the wheel ready to go excitement and not excitement but I suppose you know ready to help and, and brace for kind of whatever would give I think none of us really wished or thought it would go on for the length of time that it would um you know that we'd be in our, our third or fourth lockdown or whatever it's this stage and you know into you know the, the third wave and i think we didn't expect there to be a, a wave kind of as as bad as there was you know the, the time after christmas i think you know credit to to the society and to everyone the first time round, um, knocking down and really managing to, to get um to get on top of it, and then just you know the the combination of obviously the the new variants and um Christmas and just you know the inside nature that there was obviously um the 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 kind of the the, the surge or the outbreak of cases then around Christmas time um was just yeah it was just challenging I think you know physically it was obviously very demanding we. Mm um i the, the the lovely job of doing our roster for for um for for vincent so um that was kind of challenging in itself and you know you kind of you, you're conscious of how much people are working you're trying to give people rest days and even just the i suppose the challenge of you know people going into the intensive care units you may not be used to to working and, and the, the stresses of that and you know the emotional toil of that as well um and yeah look it was a it was challenging um i we in hospital yeah we seem to be getting back into the side we're, we're back to kind of running full theater lists and things like that which is great um you know the the surge they call it we've kind of decanted a lot of our or all of our COVID ICUs and things like that we're kind of back to our normal ICU cool. um quota I suppose it's kind of the after effects of that that we're being kind of seen for a few weeks afterwards just you know burnout between nursing staff and some of the medical staff as well and you know I was even talking to one of my colleagues today that like just coming to the end of the year you are quite tired I mean you've, you've time off or you've leave but you know you're still you can't even if you go away or even if you see family you kind of feel like you can't really let your guard down and things like that so that's kind of all I suppose like mentally a little bit challenging and you probably don't even realize the toll that it's that it's taken on you um but yeah I suppose with the vaccines it kind of seems like things are 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 looking up a little bit i know yeah. in work it's it's you know it, it it gave us a great boost back in january um to even just to have that little bit of extra protection and that extra cushion and then obviously people are probably now coming to the stage that parents and things like that are getting um vaccinated which is nice um but yeah look i suppose you know you kind of don't want to get too far or ahead of yourself either and you know this was taking chance or taking risks before the restrictions or before it's really safe to do so but um yeah look i i would certainly hope that those kind of two months that you know we had to face in work after christmas that we wouldn't have to face anything like that again it was very challenging i think you know the thing that was almost hardest was obviously it was christmas time so there was a lot of families coming together obviously the nature of coronavirus is very easy, easily spread and unfortunately with contact tracing you kind of tend to find out exactly where it's come from so you, you know you're kind of dealing with family members who are struggling with the guilt of you know whether they were the ones that had caught it and passed it on to elderly family members or who were sick themselves at home and were worried about family members in hospital you know we'd people who had family members down in in Wexford and then up here and they were kind of you know trying to just get phone calls and get details and kind of the stress of that or even just young kids 
um so yeah like that was all kind of really challenging I suppose it's kind of that type of stuff that you don't think about away from the challenging kind of you know nature of the disease itself and, tr and treating that but uh yeah look I suppose we've just been conscious in work of trying to to look after each other and kind of check in and you know give people breaks when, when they need it but uh, I, I think hopefully we're on the other side but to be honest I mean I think it's something that we're probably going to be dealing with for a little bit um and a while afterwards as well in terms of of the healthcare and you know rebuilding it a little bit yeah absolutely and I, I just thinking while you were talking there in a while about how you actually managed to get through an inter-county season I know it was a condensed inter-county season in 2020 but how, how did you manage all to juggle everything I mean you're on shifts you're, you're trying to get to training you're playing matches um you know and again I suppose a, a follow-on question from that Noel what was the experience like of playing in, in the 2020 championship behind closed doors effectively when for example you look back in 2017 there's 46,000 plus there there's 50,000 plus a year later there's 56,000 plus a year after that what was the, what, what was that entire experience like um, that condensed period of time when you're trying to juggle work and you're playing football and you're, and you're playing football behind closed doors yeah um i suppose the work training yeah that was a bit challenging um I, put it mildly i'd imagine yeah yeah um i did the added benefit of having to sit my final exams the first week of december so i sat my final um anesthetic exams on the tuesday i think after we played our ma in the all ireland semi-final so um yeah it was tiring to say the least but um i don't know i suppose in 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 one way it was kind of unusual in that we didn't really have anything outside of football to do I mean there was Dublin was in a level five lockdown from October um so we actually were hugely thankful to have football you know we were really conscious of the fact that we had the opportunity five nights a week to go out and meet our friends and to play sport and to play a hobby that we absolutely loved so I mean from that point of view it wasn't really that much of an added stress at all um yeah going from work uh was challenging and obviously um you know you, you're very conscious of, of bringing anything into the panel we'd um a, a few healthcare workers in our team obviously Siobhan Colleen um Lucy and Lucy Collins and Eve Sweeney um working in different hospitals so you know you've, you've that as well you've teachers in school so um just getting used to the setup I suppose of you know split dressing rooms you know being strict with each other um in terms of wearing masks doing COVID questionnaire the hand hygiene remembering to bring your own water bottle um and then you know you kind of miss the little things of being able to sit around with each other afterwards and, and have a bite to eat um or you know go for a coffee with people after training on a, on a Sunday or going for a swim or even just you know you doing your usual carpools we kind of tried to split that up as much as possible and even if we were carpooling it was you know you're sitting in the back with a mask on so it was very different from that point of view and um I suppose they're the kind of things that you miss from it because obviously the training, you know, you enjoy doing that and challenging, but when you can't do the kind of social stuff or the team building stuff afterwards, um, you do miss it, uh, definitely. Um, even then, just in terms of, I suppose, completely different, we all travelled by ourselves to matches, so that, that's a new challenge as well. Um, and then, you know, the preparation within the matches, obviously, we, I think we had 13 minutes in the changing room, so you need to change your kind of whole warm-up routine. Um, we had split our panel for most of it in between two dress rooms as well which is a, a challenge in itself because when you never want to have a kind of designated division within your team between you know mm. the starting players and those who are going to come in so um you know I think we did well and we had enough kind of strong characters and leaders within both groups to kind of make sure that that wasn't you know too much of an issue and that you know we still kind of had that unity as well um and yeah look the matches themselves were obviously strange the turnaround between them was really quick um I think the you know the week leading up to the Donegal game was probably one of the most stressful ones that I had in terms of a, the you know footballing career. I think we uh, we didn't really know where we were in terms of championship preparation. Um, Donegal are a phenomenal team. They have huge uh, firepower. You know they they can get goals so quickly and so easily. So I think. Certainly, it was one of the most nervous I was going into a game. Um, I think a lot of the girls kind of felt the same, and I think you could kind of see that in, in the way we played at the start. And you know, it was great to kind of get, you know, I suppose close out the game well um, and control the game. That kind of gave us a little bit of confidence going into the next few games. The turnaround of the week between um, that and the Waterford game was was really quick as well. Trying to prepare for for another championship match, um, and then yeah, look, I suppose playing with our crowds was was really strange. Um, 
I think once you once you start the match, you kind of don't really notice it. Um, I don't know watching or I don't know the effect that it kind of had on, on, on closing out the games. You know, would there have been a bit, a bit more of, of excitement or a bit more of a switch in the game or if, you know, there was a crowd there kind of cheering you on as well. Um, it, it's hard to know. It's kind of not something that you really take much heed of when you when you when you started. Um, but I think, yeah, it was unusual kind of not even just having like family and friends there. Um, yeah, it's very strange kind of ringing your dad after a match or ringing your friends afterwards and kind of talking them through it that way. Um, and I know for them, that was something that they really missed as well, um, just getting to matches. And I suppose it's unfortunate that that was kind of the, the way that my last season uh, finished out. You know, they were such constants for every match mm. that I played with in a Dublin jersey. And it's kind of, you know, I suppose it's a little bit unfortunate that they, they weren't there for my last one. But um, I suppose I gave them <laughs> cut in a few days in, out in the years before that. But uh, yeah, look, please God, we'll have uh, some some crowds at the at the matches um you know this year because I think I think it does you know it's, it's a spectator sport and I think it probably does add to it whether you know subconsciously we're aware of it or not you know somebody bearing down and gold the you know the heightened sensation of the crowd cheer kind of lifting um is brilliant and you know when you compare I suppose the color and the the atmosphere you know the 2017 18 19 finals even in, even in the lashings of rain like mm. Uh, it just adds to the whole spectacle, I suppose. So, you know, while it was something I think we had kind of said all along was something in 2020 that we wanted to achieve just for us, um, you know, regardless, and I suppose in spite of all the challenges that we faced and kind of to prove that, you know, regardless of what's thrown at us, we're, we're still good enough to to win. Um, that was, you know, something that was really satisfying. And I suppose sometimes it's kind of nice. I mean, you you we, we've had the huge days and the huge crowd so to kind of I suppose have that that intimacy and to have Croke Park to yourself um and to kind of get time to really celebrate and you know properly talk to each other rather than you know everybody kind of disbanding in different directions afterwards was was lovely yeah absolutely you bring up so many great memories there um well, you'd be glad to know after coming off a, a night shift that uh, I'm 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 almost finished uh, <laughs> asking questions. Um, but you know, you mentioned uh, the memories just come flooding back because I've been there for so many of them. But you mentioned um, the Donegal game and and it was fright night and Sinead's mad goal that went in off the the upright and came down into the net and uh, um, you know just one among countless. If I was to put your and a final question on, if I was to put your pin uh, to the uh, put you to the pin of your collar and ask you. You're taking one memory as a standout from from that wonderful intercounty career that you've had. Uh, what is it, and why? God, um, <laughs> one. Uh, I think probably for me the the countdown for the last three minutes for the twenty seventeen All Ireland final. Sure. Um, yeah. Because you felt you felt it was in the bag. It was obviously a, a feeling of it's in the bag. We can enjoy this. Yeah, and I suppose you know, obviously, one of the great things about Ladies' Gaelic Football is that countdown is the hooter. So I suppose you kind of you know exactly when it's going to go off. And so many times we've been on the opposite side of it with the you know just chasing a ball and whatever lost hope um, that you might get even an equalising point or, or something. Um, so to kind of know, I think we were. 11 or 12 or I think 11 points up at that stage and to kind of hear people starting to count down and to you know <laughs> cast a little look over to the to the bench and see the girls ready to, to to run onto the pitch was just yeah look it was unbelievable I suppose to kind of know finally you were going to be I suppose that we'd actually done it um and that you know yeah that it was I suppose going to be our day and that we were finally going to be able to celebrate was just amazing brilliant yeah, absolutely. Um, final, final questions. You'll still go with St. Bridget's for the year ahead, will you, Noel? Or what's the what's the plan if, if club gets yeah. back going? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, dying to get back uh, with the girls um, and play. Uh, yeah, uh, Jesus, yeah. Um, I suppose it's just a little bit of a less demand, but um, absolutely not ready to to hang up the boots just yet. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed. We've we've got a good team. We've got a lot of very good young players coming through. Um, you know, Aoife Coffey and Ellen Cribben on our team. So, um, really exciting players. I absolutely loved the the season last year. Um, you know, we almost got relegated out of, <laughs> out of senior, but um, it was just a really nice rebuilding year for everyone. So we've we've got a great management team. Um, Sirka Furlong is you know back with us. We've Jim Brogan, Caroline's, um, our captain's dad has come in to give us a hand as well. And, and you know, just a really enthusiastic management team in Damien Smith. So, I mean, obviously, 
it's a big challenge against uh, Kilmacud, Crokes and Fox Rock. But, um, you know, the, the Dublin Championship is always really exciting. So hopefully we'll get, we'll get, um, we'll get a good run at it. Wish you well, Noel. Thanks for coming on. Cheers, not at all. Thanks very much.